Thank you very much indeed, uh, Stephen and Christian, for the invitation and for the opportunity to give this presentation. I'll just share my screen and uh, hopefully we can get going um, straight away. Can everybody see that okay? Okay, so what I'd like to do today uh, is talk about a couple of examples of some work that we've been doing that have really been um, carried out over the last decade or so, um, sort of involving um, the evolving wor world of both conservation genetics in, con in conservation policy action, but also involving the, um, the changes in um, both um, technologies, um, uh, methods of analysis, and methods of application of genomics um, in endangered species. So I'm going to um, predominantly fo focus around the following to topics. A little bit of background from my IUCN work on the development of genetics and genomics in conservation policy, which has been a rocky road, which we are still traveling on. I'm going to talk about um, genomics and recent climatic adaptation from different sources um, by using two examples of falcon um, studies that we've carried out um, over the last decade. And then I'm going to um, pick up on something that's really interesting and intriguing me at the moment, which is the emerging role of adaptive introgression um, as an accelerating influence in local adaptation. I know you as botanists understand better than most um, zoologists uh, what how important introgression is, but I think even in our animal domain now we're beginning to realize just how ubiquitous and interesting and important uh, introgression is as an evolutionary force in the genomes of, of uh, animal species. And I'm going to um, talk about that not only from the context of adaptive introgression, but also how it can um, in, interact with our normal evolutionary inferences that we use in uh, conservation biology. And then I will um, bring you up to date with where we are with the current policy situation for um, genetics, particularly in the context of the Convention on Biological Diversities post-2020 framework. So just to go uh, into the background, um, I, I've been working in the field for a, a while, um, since the mid 1980s when I started my PhD, but the, um, the role of genetics in conservation um, biology um, was recognized as far back as the early 1980s with uh, Franklin Soule's seminal um, book, um, Conservation and Evolution. And with the arrival of DNA-based studies in, in the 70s and 80s, um, culminating with the journal Molecular Ecology in the 90s, the overlap between the development of genetic diversity tools at the DNA level and the acceleration in policy that was happening at a global level at that time. For example, the original Rio Convention, the EEC Habitats Directive, both of which um, arrived in the early 90s as well, um, began uh, to open up a vista for interaction between genetics and conservation policy that um, was quite exciting, uh, at least to us. Um, that it has only really been realized um, in North America until very recently has been a, a, a somewhat disappointing um, development, I would say, although there are a few countries in Europe where genetics and conservation policy is, are much more closely working together. Um, but over the last decade, and since especially um, the 20, um, 20 HE targets were first published after the, um, the, uh, the meeting, the CBD meeting in Nagoya in 2010, um, people have started to really sit up and take notice because as signatories of the convention, they've had to. So this target 13 that came out of the, uh, of, of the Nagoya meeting basically said that the genetic diversity of cultivated plants, farmed and domesticated animals their wild relatives, and including socioeconomically and culturally valuable species, should be maintained and strategy, strategy should be developed and implemented for minimizing genetic erosion and safeguarding genetic diversity. Now, over that period, 
lots of uh, countries have started scratching their heads and asking the question, how are we going to go about doing that? And as, as is with all, always the case with the CBD, we've come up with a number of different solutions, um, but have really been playing catch up. Because in contrast to ecosystem and species diversity, um, the, a lot of the basic um, uh, infrastructure hasn't been in place to do this properly particularly around, for example, the levels of genetic monitoring that would be required to fulfill this even modest target. And partly as a consequence of that, and I think you're all aware of this, um, amid, there was a midterm analysis of progress or towards the AEGE targets in um, late 2014, which showed in, in, in panel F here that um, one of the biggest issues is that how these uh, model fits of, of, of progress uh, in these areas showed that, in fact, um, a very, very crude indicator of genetic diversity that was adopted by CBD um, for this particular uh, target, which was the number of livestock breeds, as if the number of livestock breeds on planet Earth is a good proxy indicator for genetic diversity as a whole. Even that was failing to meet the targets that were established um, during the original AHE um, uh, proclamation. So it's essentially, during the, the last decade, we um, used very, very uh, crude proxy indicators for genetic diversity. And even in those circumstances, we were, being, we were shown to be failing. So what we've been working on subsequently is to improve those indicators, improve the targets, and um, at least give ourselves the opportunity to have a more um, holistic and honest um, estimator of how we are conserving genetic diversity, not only in domesticated species, but in wild species as well. And I will come back to that to give you an idea of where we've been since that, um, that since it was clear by 2020 that a lot of these um, targets had not been met. And I'm gonna go on and, and, and talk then about a couple of um, uh, of studies that we've carried out, one in very brief, but one a bit longer, um, which gives us hope that understanding changes in genomic diversity can happen over a rapid scale, a uh, rapid time scale, and that those these changes may be things that we can incorporate into this policy framework. And um, and and they, they and I've chosen them because they've been surprising to us within that context in terms of the timescales over which they've operated. So um, I'm, in general, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a study that myself, my colleagues uh, at um, the Institute of Zoology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences um, and colleagues um, at the um, Environment Agency Abu Dhabi have been carrying out uh, over the last 10 or so years on Arctic breeding peregrine falcons. Um, and these um, birds, we've been studying from the perspective of their um, unsustainable trapping rate and their un a need to understand their population biology to be able to um, address the targets in the Convention on Migratory Species, the UN Convention on Migratory Species, uh, which means that we have to identify these migratory populations. Basically, this one subspecies um, uh, breeds right across the northern part of Eurasia, all the way from Finland to Eastern Russia. Um, and we've been studying these populations now by fitting satellite collars um, to these uh, uh, tags, to these animals and following over multiple years, um, looking at their genetic diversity, looking at their migratory behavior, how that has changed over time and um, taking the genomic data that we've produced to look at the, the history. And so we've been able to get sort of fairly fine scale um, uh, information. Just here's just three populations as an example, a cartoon to show how um, one can follow the, um, the migratory routes that happen from the, the summer breeding grounds to the wintering grounds and backwards. And these birds exhibit incredible levels of natal site fidelity, um, they, but, but they are migrating across a landscape that is rapidly changing rapidly warming, being rapidly urbanized, um, and where the distinction between um, the uh, conditions in the breeding sites and the wintering sites are becoming more and more nuanced. 
And um, what we initially did, and this is right back back now uh, over ten years ago, was uh, construct um, some 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 new de novo genomes. In fact, uh, the the first and the third and fourth a, uh, fourth and fifth avian genomes, the peregrine and saker falcons. We needed these to be able to carry out the work that we were doing. So we um, uh, constructed um, uh, those genomes uh, using uh, back in back in the day short read uh, sequencing. So they're not modern um, uh, long read sequences, but they were um, they were some of the first and highest coverage avian genomes, and we've been able to use them relatively. And they've been augmented subsequently, annotated almost completely, uh, and they've been very very useful in the work that we've been doing. And we've also been um, using transcriptome data to, um, to, to augment this work, to, be, to work on population level um, uh, for certain species as well. And for the Saker falcon, which is one of the two species that we sequenced, we, um, we've looked at transcriptomes to understand their evolutionary history um, so that we could understand a little bit more about what, what populations actually exist because previous work using genetic data, microsatellite markers, mitochondrial markers, had shown very little population structure, which from the perspective of the CMS means that these populations could be regarded as a single unit. We wanted to re-examine that using omic level data, which is what we did. And indeed, as, as you might um, not be surprised to find, we found a, a very different pattern when we, when we looked at this. And in fact, what we found was the, the Western populations, uh, breeding populations, um, in this case, represented by a population in Slovenia, but there are a number of others that we that we um, examined. Um, we compared those with the populations in Kazakhstan and Mongolia, the great open steppe grassland where the Saker falcon is at its most um, is its its most uh, um, uh, uh, common, and then also with a population that now has is that is expanding across the the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. Now, um, we, we, when we used the, um, the data that we had, we, we were looking at uh, uh, about 67% of the gene set in the transcriptome, about 380,000 um, SNPs. Um, and that gave us a lot of um, interesting information. And one of the things that it told us when we actually um, went and did some uh, genealogical analysis is that the population that exists on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau must have arrived there very recently. Um, and the, uh, the uh, genealogical simulations that we carried out uh, indicate that the populations have been spreading across from west to east over the last 30,000 years since the Saker um, diverged from the um, Gia Falcon and the, um, the Lana Falcon. And um, so it's a relatively recently um, evolved species and only in the last two or 3,000 years as it started to occupy the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. And that's um, not surprising because to live on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau full time is demanding, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and we were um, delighted, but perhaps not totally surprised to see when we did our analysis of selection across the genome of the Qinghai birds, and we compared those with those in the, the rest of the Kazan, Kazakhstan, Mongolia step, um, of the 37 SNPs that we identified, um, 17 genes uh, were, were, uh, came through and three um, were hypoxia genes um, and four were genes to do with in immunity. So EPAS1, which is the, the poster child for hypoxia regulation um, in, in um, high altitude adaptation, um, was the uh, was our top um, uh, uh, most selected SNP, and in fact, unusually for EPAS one um, selection signatures as well. This was an actual uh, non-synonymous substitution that changed the amino acid um, in the fourth exon, um, and we also found evidence of relaxed selection uh, at, at the MH two class um, and MHC class two beta um, in in high altitude populations as well which was also, and less surprisingly, of course, an exonic substitution, um, where uh, it is known that the um, immune um, uh, challenge at very high altitudes is lower than it is for populations at low altitudes, because there is a much less diverse 
uh, pathogen community at very high altitudes. And we're talking about an average of 4,000 ASL here. EPAS-1 is a recurrent um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, feature of selection signature analysis in high altitude um, work that's been carried out at the genomic level on the Tibetan plateau. It occurs in the Tibetan pig, um, which appear, from which it appears to have um, uh, gained that uh, allele from uh, its wild cousin, the Tibetan wild boar. The Tibetan mastiff is another um, species that has got EPAS-1 that is highlighted. Different, different, um, different changes in the genes, but nevertheless, again, coming from a closely related ancestor, the Tibetan gray wolf. Um, and obviously we know the humans that live there with, um, that, that have um, an, an EPAS-1 substitution that is thought to have actually um, uh, had its origin in Denisovan people and actually that it's a Denisovan introgression, adaptive introgression that, that um, has been implicated in the colonization of high altitude uh, landscapes by Tibetan people. And here we have found it again with the, um, the Seika falcon as well. So that was interesting. The one thing I should point out that's really important is that when you examine the uh, EPAS-1 gene allele frequencies in uh, the population um, in Kazakhstan and Mongolia, it's not as, a, as if this is a, an introgression. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a, um, a change in frequency from variation that is already present in Kazakhstan and Mongolia as, as standing variation. So in the case of the, um, the, the, the Tibetan population of the Seika falcon, this is just a very rapid turnover in allele frequencies that's happened in the two or so thousand years since these populations have occupied um, the, the Tibetan plateau. When we then went back and looked at the, uh, using uh, different um, methods, whole genome resequencing predominantly for our migratory populations of peregrines, um, we, we found some very, very interesting observations, one of which is that um, there's a big uh, disparity between um, the, um, uh, the annual migration lengths between eastern populations of the, um, the northern breeding peregrine falcon and certain western populations. Not, not, in, not completely, but, but overall quite a big disparity with the Colimar population migrating 11,200 kilometers from wintering ground to breeding ground. So there's, there is a, a, a big disparity in the, um, the, both the, the, the scale and the direction in which a lot of these migration patterns are working. But we found that these populations were genetically, in, on, on the whole, genetically very distinct. And what it in fact um, invoked when we looked at this, and we're, I'm going to particularly focus on Kolgwev, Yamal, Lena, and Kolima, um, so two in the east and two in the west. Um, what we've, we found is that when we carried out the analysis using the whole ge genomes from 35 individuals from those four populations, um, was that um, the, uh, the, we, we could reconstruct the um, ancestral divergence order between those populations, um, starting um, between the two, the, the, the two eastern and western populations at about 22,000 years ago. At about 12,000 years ago, we saw the splitting off of uh, Yamal and, um, and, uh, and Kolgwev, and about 10,000 years ago between um, uh, between uh, the populations in, in uh, um, Lena and Kolima. Um, and when you look at the migration distance and you um, look at the genetic distance between individuals migrating at different distances along the migratory pathway, we see no um, significant difference or so no significant relationship between migratory distance and neutral genetic distance um, uh, in our comparisons. But when we um, just look at the genes that we found to be under evidence of strong selection um, using EXPHH, we find a very, very strong correlation indeed. So migratory root distance, the distance was recapitulated by uh, genetic differentiation. I should add that migratory root um, direction was not. There was no evidence, for example, that these populations were following the Earth's magnetic 
um, uh, uh, access or, or, or fo following magnetic pathways at all, um, but they were migrating at very, very different dif distances. When we examined um, the, uh, the hierarchical differences at the genomic level between the um, populations migrating in short distance and long distance, we um, identified a gene which really surprised us. And this is adenylcyclase type 8, ADCY8. Uh, and this gene is known to be important behaviorally. We thought it would be important um, from the perspective of either timing of migration or potentially uh, direction of migration. Actually, it's a gene that has been associated um, in many studies now with long-term uh, long memory. So this appears to be not a gene that's involved in the initial decision in which direction to go, but in maintaining that high not, uh, fidelity that we see in um, individual movements um, through enhancing long-term memory. And it's an, in fact, an incredibly simple substitution uh, with a, an A to C, uh, an A to T um, fixed difference in the East. And what that does is it removes CPG methylation um, and, and that has a, 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 a very interesting impact on the level of substitute of, 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 um, of, of uh, uh, expression. And if we look at um, panel M here, you just want to really compare the expression levels, the exp um, luciferase activity in promoter haplotype one, which is the one that's found in the Kola Peninsula and promoter haplotype two, which is the, um, uh, 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 the uh, haplotype that's found in Polymer and Yamal. And you can see that there is a big difference in the expression level. This is when we express that, um, those two different alleles in um, Chick Hippocampus. So this is interesting. It gives us an, an idea that it's not really simply uh, migratory um, uh, direction, which is what has been found for other species that is being uh, that, that may have a genetic control, although there's no real smoking gun for that either, um, but it's migratory um, distance and long-term memory that are linked. Well, why is this important for climate change? Well, the reason why it's important for climate change is that if we look at the 2070 predictions for the um, location of the breeding and wintering grounds and the size of those breeding wintering grounds, which we were able to um, uh, do species distribution modeling at the last glacial maximum, the mid-Holocene today and in 2070, it implies that some populations um, are going to go extinct um, into potentially by two different processes. The first one is a gradual loss of individuals. So in, in panel B, um, this is an analysis of linkage disequilibrium um, uh, uh, based effective population size that we carried out. On, on these populations, which showed a, a really major decline in effective population size over the last 25 generations, so recent, but, but substantial um, and tending towards zero in some populations. And um, the, the, that effective population size is predicted to really uh, go down to unviable levels, at least in one population, which is Colgwev. And at the same time, our species distribution models are also telling us that the uh, the, the population in Colgwev actually won't have anywhere to breed under um, standard SDMs, um, given, given the level of warm, warm 1.5 degrees, which is now a joke, of course, um, change in, 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 in temperature uh, over time. On top of that, some of the breeding and uh, wintering grounds are going to be potentially merging, particularly Kola, the, the population in Kola in Finland, um, where the, the overlap uh, between breeding and feeding grounds may, may in fact turn that population into a partially migrating uh, population as opposed to uh, a wholly migrating population. So if we look at these, these different um, approaches, you can see that a combination of genomics to get at the, the fundamental basis of what these behaviors mean and uh, combining those with an understanding of the effective population size demographic trajectory and species distribution um, can be used together in, uh, synergistically to give you a picture of what might be happening to populations in the near future. Okay, so that's the, the two falcons. 
Um, but as I say, the, the interesting thing that I think is important about those is that they they are they're slightly different in the sense that they um, they they tell a different story about expansion and contraction, but they're all telling those stories over relatively recent timescales, which we can apply using genomics to uh, policy related decision making. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about adaptive introgression, um, and I'm going to use an example from a study that we published um, a couple of years ago now, uh, last year, sorry, um, on the one of my favorite groups that I worked on, the South American uh, camelids. Um, and the four species of South American camelids you can see in front of you here, um, the two brown ones are the wild ancestor species, the one in the front is the vicuña, which is a relatively small, high altitude living um, uh, 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 camelid uh, with fleece that has extremely high value, um, very, very fine fiber. And the animal standing at the back is the wanaco, which was is found across the large grasslands at low and high elevation um, across um, sub-Amazonian South America. Um, and both of these have been very important for native communities um, since they arrived. Um, and have been domesticated both as pack animals and the animal in the middle with the banana shaped ears is the Yama, which is the pack animal um, of the Inca and the pre-Incas, um, which facilitated the Inca um, uh, 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 empire expansion. And then the one below it, which is the, the fleecy one, the furry one, which is the alpaca, which produces some of the best fiber that you'll find um, anywhere in the world. Um, and which is um, uh, important economically um, in the impoverished uh, Andean region. And when we, um, we, we were very, very interested in understanding the evolutionary history of these animals, we previously published some work based on a few molecular markers, which indicated that the vicuña, uh, which had previously not been considered as, a, as an, a domesticated ancestor, indicated that the vicuña was the ancestor of the alpaca and that the wanaco was the ancestor of the yama. So we um, revisited that. Um, we had some very, very counterintuitive results that, in, that, that did in, um, imply that in, introgression may be relatively strong in these populations. And so we did some work, um, sequenced a lot of new genomes, created some new reference genomes. Only the vicuña, uh, only the alpaca, sorry, had previously been um, sequenced. And what we found was that um, we, 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 we found that the vicuña um, and the, um, the Wanako, the, the, the two uh, the subspecies that exist along the Andean chain grouped together as we sort of expected them to. Um, the only exception was that the Wanako caxalensis subspecies, in, which is the northern subspecies, um, it seems that two of the animals that we use were misidentified. In, in red here is the, uh, the Yama, and the, but the puzzling result for us was the, the result of the the vicuña, where we, uh, the alpaca, where we found two groups of alpaca here and here, and the, we found the alpaca being um, ha, with much longer branch lengths than the rest of the group. So we were really surprised to see what that, what would be uh, underlying that. When we did, we did all sorts of analysis, but here's a um, a simple admixture analysis just to show you. And the the one thing that you can see immediately is that at k equals two, the alpaca shows very high levels of admixture admixture from Yama, as we had hinted at with the genetic data that we found previously. And if you go through this at higher and higher levels of K, these admixture resolves itself ultimately, such as to the extent by the time you get to K equals five, the alpaca looks as like it's um, a different genetic group. But of course, underlying that is, is, is admixture between the Cunha Vicuña mensalis, the northern, the northern Vicuña and the, the Yama. So when you've got that level of admixture, and it's about 35 to 40 percent, depending on which admixture method you use, when you've got that level of admixture, it's clearly really difficult to understand what's going to going on at the genomic level to get an idea of selection. And so we realized that we had a lot of work on our hands. And so what we effect effectively did was use local ancestry inference um, using both the wild ancestors and in some cases, um, the, the Bactrian camel as well, um, at different levels to infer the, um, the, the, the level of, um, uh, uh, of introgression into the genome. 
And we found very, very high levels of introgression, as I told, as I've already said, very high levels of introgression, something in the region of 35 to 40 percent um, in the genome of the alpaca. But we also found four to five percent introgression um, into the, uh, the genome of the, oh, sorry, into the genome of the llama. Here's the alpaca, here is the llama, and here are a few of the genes that we, or gene groups that we identified. When we did an analysis of the length and the recombination rate of these introgress segments, even though the level and, and the pattern of introgression into these two different species is strikingly different, what we found was that the in terms of generations ago, they both gave the same answer. They both showed that the most likely um, uh, time of introgression was between 115 and 120 generations ago, which uh, uh, these, these animals have a generation time of approximately five years. So this is five to 600 years ago, and I will come back to that. But when we did the LAI analysis and we did a whole number of different um, uh, local ancestry and um, Abu Baba kinds of analyses to identify these introgress fra fragments, we found some, some interesting patterns. Um, it had long been uh, uh, you know, a matter of debate as to why we find exactly the same weird phenotype in Yamas and alpacas, um, which is the, the white fleece, blue eyed um, phenotype, which actually also comes along with it um, a number of other hereditary defects, including deafness. Um, when we looked at the EDN3, the endothelin 3 gene, and we mapped this um, in, in these two species against the wild ancestor, in dark blue here is the uh, EDN3 gene in the Wanako, and in, in, um, in green, further right at the bottom is the EDN, EDN3 gene in um, the Vicunia. You can see what's happened here is that the, um, the, the, the original set of polymorphisms that have created this phenotype were passed from the, um, the, the vicunia to the alpaca during domestication and have been further passed from the vicunia to the, up to the llama in, um, in, 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 during um, uh, uh, adaptive introgression or introgression that has been um, uh, guided by um, local farmers. And it seems therefore that the, this, this, um, this white fleeced blue eyed phenotype has come from the direction of the alpaca and the vicuña um, uh, into the llama and is not an, uh, an independent um, uh, polymorphism as had once been thought. And another example, perhaps even more interesting, is what's known as the ANTRX2 region, which has gone in the opposite direction, which has come from the, the uh, uh, guanaco into the um, uh, uh, llama, then into the alpaca and is not present at all in the vicuña. And this is a very exciting region because it contains uh, genes that, are, uh, that have been associated with anthrax resistance or anthrax susceptibility, fleece dimensions, but most importantly, high altitude blood pressure in humans and more recently now uh, shown in, in, um, in, uh, uh, in South American camelids as well. So it seems like this adaptive introgression may be the key to part of the key by which the um, alpaca particularly can exist in high altitudes um, uh, alongside the, uh, the, the, the vicuña and the, um, the yama. So we have an analyzed overall what's been introgressed between these two um, different groups. And then there's a whole bunch of different genes, some of which are, are genes which are very obviously those which would make sense of had they been selected by pre-incas. So those to do with, for example, um, fiber quality, uh, the agouti signaling protein is an obvious one from the perspective and the melanogenesis genes are important also for fleece color. But the olfactory receptor genes, which we have found, um, they're very commonly found um, as, as being adaptively introgressed for species that have been living in different habitats. Um, there was a recent publication that we were involved in looking at adaptive introgression from a whole number of wild sheep species into modern domestic sheep, um, and olfactory receptors are very heavily implicated in that as well. So a whole number of different uh, genes that are potentially uh, of interest in, in terms of 
future selection and selection um, to have got them to where they are at the moment. Okay, what, well, why is that? That's, that, that's interesting uh, in terms of rapid evolution. Again, we're looking at these events over a, a you know, 100 generation time scale, 500 years. Um, why is that important in terms of inference? Well, one of the things that we did, of course, was the, we stripped out those uh, local, ans uh, local um, uh, ancestry infer inferred introgress segments. And we went back and looked at the alpaca and we reanalyzed the tree. Unfortunately, when we'd done that, uh, we got a phylogenetic signal, which is far more sensible than the original one I sold, I showed you, which was clearly being disrupted um, by the level of introgression that we were having in the genome. And so um, that the, you know, uh, introgression can have a huge impact on, on very, very basic um, phylogenetic analyses, but it can also have an impact on uh, quite a lot of other things as well. Here is uh, in, in, the, in the bottom uh, uh, right of the, of the plot is a um, P PSMC plot, a pairwise sequential Markov Markovian coalescent plot that was published back in 2013 for, for the camelids, um, which shows you the PSMC um, shape for the, uh, for the original um, alpaca genome, showing a massive demographic rise, um, which, which was unmeasurable, um, that was happening somewhere in the region of 50,000 years ago. If you strip out the introgressed element from that an analysis, that signal goes away. Yes, it does have a slightly higher effective population size, um, you know, somewhere, you know, possibly, um, uh, you know, but but nowhere near as 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 high and well infinite as was being um, uh, inferred from the original paper. So it's really important when you do demographic inference to be looking out for large scale admixture because it can completely obscure the true signal of what you're you're looking for. And when we did the uh, linkage disequilibrium analysis using a program that we wrote called SNEP which is essentially uh, looking at um, changes in linkage to in, in linkage disequilibrium um, uh, patterns over very, very short generation uh, changes, we can apply this to take the, um, the signature that you get from something like PSMC much, much closer to the modern day, because that's been one of the issues. Even with MSMC, you get a lot of uncertainty when you're getting down um, in the last, you know, sort of 10, 10 to 100 generations in, in most species that you're going to be looking at. And what we found was that, the, that we saw a, a big decline in, in effective population size over the last 200 generations, but a pulse in decline at 110 generations. And that maps on, if you remember, to the pulse of admixture that we detected originally in using the LA, LAI um, block analysis that we did um, uh, on these intragress genomes. So we were racking our brains as to what happened. And in fact, um, there is one sort of really strong event which might explain this, which was the, the Spanish conquest. The Spanish arrived in 1530. If you read a lot of the documentation that they produced um, upon arrival, the, they didn't recognize that there were two domesticated um, camelid species. They called them all sheep, effectively. Um, and as the, um, the Inca and the other um, ethnic groups didn't keep um, uh, anything other than oral traditions, a lot of the tradition for breeding these animals um, uh, to, to type and producing the wonderful fine fiber that they did um, disappeared at the same time as the gen genocide happened of the local communities um, after the the, 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 the Spanish conquest. So um, once the, those, those breeding traditions have broken down, we think it's quite possible that the traditional breeding um, uh, activities are broke down and, and introgression followed. And so the introgression events may be relatively recent, um, although the, the, there, are, uh, there, there could be some that are older, but in general, there will be relatively recent introgression events. Um, as a result of the breakdown of um, the, uh, the traditional uh, South American camelid um, breeding practices. So finally, then, I'm going to quickly get to uh, current policy situations. 
Um, one of the things that, that, that we've been doing over the last year intensively is talking to policymakers in advance of the discussions that have been ha had on the post-2020 framework for uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we have received a lot of advice, strong advice, that we really needed to get as many papers out that made the case for the inclusion of genetic diversity more explicitly and explicitly in the global framework and how to do it. So that's what we've been doing over the last year, um, pu published a, quite a high number of papers in and around both um, proposing targets and indicators. We've also formed a coalition between the IUCN Conservation Genetic Specialist Group, the GEOBON Genetics Working Group that does a lot of work on data amalgamation um, and earth observation, genomics groups, and the Society for Conservation Biology. So we've gotten together, published a number of these papers and proposed indicators. Um, I'm not gonna go through them here because I've, I'm out of time already, but these indicators include an indicator based around effective population size, an indicator based around the proportion of populations that are being maintained within a particular administrative region for a particular species, and at the national level, um, a, uh, an indicator based on the number of species which are being actively genetically monitored. Um, and if any of you are interested in, in these targets and how we are trying to get them implemented, um, I'm very happy to talk about that offline. We are gaining traction at the CBD level. Um, we're go getting towards the end game now on the post-2020 framework, the 2030 framework. Um, and one of the things that we're very pleased about is that wild population genetic diversity is now, it seems, set in stone. Um, you, you never really say that, um, but it, it looks like it might be. Um, and um, we have some targets in there um, that are both at milestone level, um, where you have genetic diversity of wild and domesticated species are safeguarded with an increase of proportion of species that have, have at least 90% of their genetic diversity maintained. Um, and we, we are advocating effective population size as being a measure of genetic diversity. So um, it's still under discussion, but hopefully um, we will we'll be getting to the stage fairly soon where we'll be able, be able to say to countries, this is something that you actually, if you're a signatory of the convention, this is something that you will need to monitor and actually start um, uh, uh, doing it in, in earnest. So it just remains um, for me to thank all my colleagues. Um, a lot of the work that I described today is work that I did in my sabbatical in Beijing with my colleague, um, uh, Zongru Gu, um, who we worked together both on his PhD um, and uh, on the Peregrine Falcon study, and also on the um, Camelid study as well. My colleague, um, Shang Zhang Zan, um, hosted me during this period. And I also need to um, uh, acknowledge Nick Fox and Andrew Dixon, the goddesses of the world of, uh, of falconry uh, over a decade ago. Um, and here is, I, I, I lived in Beijing for, for six months while we did this work. Um, and, uh, and it was a, a wonderful experience to get away from the, the admin and the hurly burly and actually get and handle some data sets again. So thank you very much indeed. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. That was superb. Um, loads of content there and lots of really interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm sure everybody, we're, we're getting wide applause uh, that we can't hear it. Thank you. Great. Uh, so we have some time for questions and discussion now. Um, I'm sure that has stimulated a lot of thoughts in the, in the group. Um, can I ask if you would like to ask a question, then please can you use the, the raise hand symbol? Because I think there's enough of us that it will be difficult to, to keep track of everybody. Uh, and if you can raise your hand, that would be great. Um, and I'll open the floor now. Is there anybody who would like to, to kick us off? Okay, well, I can't, I can't see a hand at the moment. I hope everybody's able to, to find the, the indicator. Um, just in the first instance, Mike, I wonder if you could comment maybe, it's great to see that the, the idea of, of taking wild 
genetic diversity into account as part of the post 2020 framework is really taking shape. Um, what do you, you feel are the, the the sort of what's the how welcome is that as a, a measure that's going to have to be a monitored by national governments? Do you yeah. So so the I mean uh, obviously as you might imagine we've had. Um, a mixed response. There have been meant, there have been quite a few countries that have advocated very strongly for it. Um, Switzerland is actually um, quite ahead of the game. It has a national genetic monitoring program that is being constructed at the moment by Martin Fisher and colleagues. And 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 um, so Switzerland is is very very highly um, um, active in this area. So is um, Sweden um, from a European perspective. Um, and there's lots of support in other countries as well. People recognize that there is, well, th people recognize, I think, three things. Firstly, that launching a national genetic monitoring program is a big ask, um, you know, and, and I think that that's um, something that um, is going to require a lot of consultation between scientists, stakeholders, and government. Um, in Scotland, for example, um, you based your genetic monitoring largely on species that were selected due to their suitability to the HE target 13 indicators. David O'Brien and colleagues have done that. Scotland leads the way on species report cards. Um, country report cards, which is another way to do it, like an IUCN country report card, requires um, a standardised protocol. We've been developing that. Um, and, and I think... Um, if we make it easy enough for the policymakers to pick this up and run with it, and if we don't try to overcomplicate it, so even if, for example, all of us in this room agree that from now on we would contextualize our studies where possible and say the evidence from the analysis that we've done is that genetic diversity in this particular species in this particular country is stable, declining, has increased or is structured, just using those words is going to provide policymakers with basic information that they can use. Now, when I did an analysis of this for a whole bunch of different countries a few years ago, the, you know, the, the, the disappointing thing was that in over half of the papers that were being published, those terms were never used. Okay, partly because they were not the point of the paper, but also because People are a little bit scared about saying those things. Um, but I, I do think that if we can at least uh, agree a, a common lexicon of, of, um, of, of wor words that we can use, the one, the, one, the one target, you know, the one indicator that we've, that is very quantitative that we've um, agreed is the proportion of populations for a given species where any is greater than 500 as opposed to those for where it's less than 500. Um, which is great. Um, and even if you don't have genetic data, we know that the modal, um, the modal uh, ratio between any and NC is about 11%. So we, you know, people can use that um, as, a, as a proxy um, or, or can choose a proxy according to the literature for their particular group of organisms. Because I would acknowledge that it wouldn't necessarily, I mean, how difficult it is for forest trees to estimate effective population size, for example. We, I hear a lot of that from my colleagues, how hard that is. So, um, but, but at least if we have these fairly simple quantitative or qualitative measures that policymakers can pick up on, then we're giving ourselves a chance. What we mustn't do is become overly, um, you know, obsessed with, um, with, with uh, you know, lots, lots of different caveats, because broadly, most of us can look at the data sets and know what they mean. And I think that that's right now, you know, given everything that's going on around us, given the fact that COP26 is going to dominate Kuching, and we, we probably won't even hear anything about Kuching next year uh, in comparison to COP26, we need that traction. Yeah, absolutely. It makes so much sense. A common language and some pragmatism, effectively. Um, Nikki, Anthony, you had a hand up. Yeah, yeah, actually, I did have a similar question, which is why I took my hand down again. Um, I would just sort of like to maybe um, talk a little bit about 
the experiences that we've had. And uh, I have my whole lab group here, including Amor Hiribinga Mikala from Gabon, um, who's actually been trying to estimate effective population sizes in wild mandrels. And um, we've been focusing on a specific cord that's been this, a long-term uh, study. But I, I guess one of the things that we've really begun to realize about doing all this kind of work is just the sample sizes that are required in order to get a good estimate of N sub E. Uh, and we've also estimated N, N, N sub E, uh, sorry, N sub C, which is a lot easier. And then expanding that into sort of larger portions of a species range, you know? Yes. Um, and so yes. I, I'm just curious to know, because it, it just seems like, it, you know, the funding that it re required <laughs> for us to actually estimate N sub E from a focal horde was ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, we're so, just wondering, you know, how do we expand this kind of approach? So there are there, there are three indi three targets or three indicators, if you like, one of which is saying how many of these populations have you been able to measure any for? And, and, and you know, um, nobody, I don't think anybody in their craziest mind would expect people to have measured any for lots and lots of populations within a country, unless there's just a few. Um, the, se the second um, indicator is the proportion of populations that are being maintained um, that, that are viable. So, so these are these are things that you can, um, you know, you don't need full data sets for. You can just take partial data sets to be able to to get them. Um, one of the things that we have been looking at as well is that what's the difference in your overall N sub E estimate? If you're looking at structured populations where you're doing it within each structured population and then amalgamating it as a whole because you as you know um, when you do that and um, there's been quite a lot of work that shows that you don't get a simple relationship between the effective population size that you estimate it doesn't sum in a, in a in a simple normal way when you compare the effective population size of fragmented <coughs> populations with the whole meta population so that that's a that's a, um, a problem but actually, if you have a, um, a country where you can show that you've got an effective population size of greater than 500, even if you know that that's not the, you, you don't know precisely what the number is, um, that is, that's also um, going to be enough. The other question is, how do you take into account the, um, the number of species that you're looking at? How many different species are you going to do that in an area? And one of the things that we've been thinking about within the context of, um, for example, the key biodiversities area concept for IUCN is to do that again, based on the choice of species that people have been looking at to describe the KBA in the first place. So um, I think measuring any is, a, is, is difficult. Whenever we bring it up, people say you can't do it. Um, but I think I think no, the don't worry. <laughs> I, 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 but I think I think the answer I think the answer is that within a certain order, order of magnitude, you can. And most of the time, are certainly not the same in Gabon. Gab Gabon's wonderful, but in Britain, most of our effective population sizes, the most of our wild populations are in, in two figures. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what anybody says then because it's not, it's not 500 and it never will be. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of thing that we need to be working towards. If it's, if it's you know, a lot of people have said, you know, what if it's 499 or 501? <laughs> I don't care about that. I think the important thing is that we get a good sort of order of magnitude estimate on what effective population size is, number one. And number two, that we're bold enough to make the statement as to whether it's, whether it's stable, expanding or contracting. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, any other questions? Christian, yes, please. I don't know if this is actually a question or a comment about adaptive introgression. <clears throat> so I work with oaks a lot, white oak species in Europe, and they hybridize happily, and we have a lot of introgression, most likely adaptive introgression. And I was also involved the last two years in some committees to talk about uh, how to sustainably uh, build the forest of the future, which provenances, which species should we choose to have a sustainable forestry and sustainable forests. And when you suggest these uh, practitioners or forest owners or even uh, people from the government to use introgress or hybrids even to be more prepared for, the, for changes in the future, they, they say no. They are 
They are all interested in pure species. That is what it's about. And of course, they are interested in provenance is where they are coming from, but they are, it's very hard to tell them actually that adaptive introgression is a good thing. And actually, I don't really know how to show it in this case. Probably we are also asking too much now. We, we kind of showed them that within species, diversity is important, use different provenances, and now we are coming with the next thing that should be important. So I'm, I'm a bit uh, clueless how to tackle this. No, I, I 100% agree with you, Christian. We, we need to um, get the message across that um, introgression is not always a bad thing, that it can be a beneficial evolutionary force. I'm a little surprised that, that, that plant, plant and forest people find that, um, that concept difficult because um, it's, 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 it's an extremely tough sell uh, in the animal world. But um, I, I, I thought you guys were much more comfortable with it than we were. Um, but in our case, I think the key thing here is that uh, we, we can demonstrate that, that um, these, these, these introgression events are actually um, enabling populations to become more viable and, and that ultimately everything is introgressed. And, you know, if we, one, one of the things that we, we talk about quite a lot is we use the um, the the, the Dennis Oven um, example as as an example of how uh, it allows opening up of new habitats for for um, for colonization and and I think um, I think the 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 policymakers have to understand that with more more data becomes more nuance and we have to realize that genomes are leaky and this is something that people yeah we didn't realize we suspected before. Um, but we had no idea what the magnitude was, and it's and, it, and it's kind of everywhere. And so I think that it, that is a, actually a major lesson that gene, the genomics era has taught us is that what we thought were pure, you know, um, un, unsullied genomes, they almost don't exist. And it's if anything, it's a function of evolutionary longevity, and that and the dissolving away of introgression through recombination. Um, that more, more than, you know, more than uh, a lack of introgression that originally happened. And that introgression is just everywhere. It's, it's something that, that, that we have to accept. I think as scientists are not the problem. <clears throat> I think the problem is the labeling. So, I mean, foresters or practitioners have to label their, their trees. They have to say this is this species or this species. And they don't want to say it's 25% this species and 75% this species, but it will give you a nice uh, advantage when it's getting drier or something. But we have to convince them that this is the good way to go. I agree. I mean, it's just biology at the end of the day. And, yep. and uh, um, you know, we, we can wish it away if we want, but I don't think we should be um, going easy on the, on the policymakers just because the truth may be unpalatable to them. What we have to do is explain it properly and say that it is, it is a ubiquitous or semi-ubiquitous observation that doesn't mean that species don't exist. It just means that they've got a more complex history than we originally thought. Great, thanks, Mike, Christian. Um, any other questions? If not, could I just take you back, um, just the one further one, a bit more specific on the, the Saker Falcon story that you, you said that there was a, a signal of a selection in, in a, partly in the immune yes. system genes um, and related that to the, the relaxed a kind of pathogen environment in the Qinghai, Qinghai Plateau. Yes. Do you think, so it, is the implication that is the so the these birds were breeding in the far north and then moving across uh, to a non-breeding areas in Qinghai is that right so no so what's happened is that um they they they're the saker falcon is really recently evolved it's pro probably one of the most recently evolved of all of the raptors um the oldest fossil is 29,000 years old Mm -hmm. And all of the molecular dating that we've done with all of the rest of the hero falcons. So that includes the Gia falcon, the um, Lanner and the, the Jugger and um, those kinds of birds. 
um, they, 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 they're actually still speciating. It's still a bit of a species swarm. But what mm-hmm. the Saka did was it appears to have migrated west to east um, from its origin in w- w- Western Eurasia, um, filled up its niches in, on the steppes. It's very, very prey based. Um, filled up his niches on the steppes um, and avoided going onto the Tibetan plateau to breed for as long as it possibly could. could. Um, and it seems as though it, it, it colonized Kazakhstan and Mongolia, um, you know, more like 10,000 years ago, but only colonized Qinghai somewhere in the region of, 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 of 2,000 years ago. Um, there was a lot of standing variation in the, the genomes of those birds and the EPAS-1 gene um, standing variation um, seems to have been, uh, you know, strongly directionally selected uh, in in terms of um, favouring one particular um, allele, which would erythropoietin allele that that is that is hypoxic um, um, resistance. But in in contrast, the the selection force that has gone for the MHC class two B has taken it in a more relaxed direction. So we see relaxed selection in comparison with both Kazakhstan and Mongolia. So they are breeding on the, Tibet, on the Tibetan plateau. They breed there and um, during that breeding process and during the, the time since they've occupied that, selection appears to have been lifted somewhat from the MHC class 2B in comparison to the Southern, well, I say, you know, they're one and a half thousand meters up. The, the real Goldilocks zone seems to be about 3,300 meters. When things start getting really, really tasty, in terms of both hypoxia and also, um, you know, other other strong selection pressures, so it seems to be since they've gone up right onto the the four thousand ASL plateau and started breeding, and they're they're everywhere there now. They're still expanding, but they are they're everywhere. That it's it appears to be during that very recent period that that's happened. And it just is as a proportion of the lifespan the 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 period of time spent in the breeding area, is that uh, relatively short? Um, it, uh, it depends. Um, there are resident birds. So this is the other complicating factor is that you have both resident and migrant birds. So um, there are resident birds up there. There are migrant birds up there. The migrant birds there um, on the Tibetan plateau actually stay there quite a long time. They're not basically chased out by the weather like they would be if they were actually the Arctic um, Calidus mm-hmm. um, peregrine falcons, they have to get out simply because they can't stay there. Um, it's not it's not quite the same thing. Um, they they come in, they come in sort of in, um, I've, I've seen them stuck, in fact, I froze my behind off watching mm-hmm. a pair starting to breed at one of our nest sites in, um, in late April in 2019. So they're there for they're there between sort of April and and uh, October. That that so it's it's right. quite a sort of classic, you know, 50-50 split. Okay, I, I think I guess what I'm getting at is whether or not is that a disease selection pressure acting at a very early life stage. Yeah, uh, it could, it it could just, be. We, we, yeah. It, exactly right. It could be, um, uh, or it could be um, acting. Yeah, as you say, on, on a particular group of the population that are the resident population more strongly than the others. So it's a combination of those, I would say. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Have we got any further questions? We have a few more minutes. Um, If not, I guess we can draw things to a close. Um, So just... Or maybe can I can I ask can I ask a yeah. last question? Uh, hi yes. Mike, this is George. Hi. George. hi. <laughs> so I would like to go back to this uh, issue of the adaptive introgression and and sort of natural process occurring and also producing uh, new adaptations. Of course, when you talk to practitioners or to politicians, you they mix a little bit what is adaptive introgression with what are uh, uh, sort of strategies of rescue where at the end uh, you have to also be careful yeah. because uh, you, don't, you don't have to just suggest the rescue in any situation because you are losing a lot of ancestry in many cases Absolutely. and people are, are sort of uh, attached 
not only because uh, some local groups of uh, animals or whatever are adapted, but also because they have specific uh, features so that are connected to the to the to the local human population. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So uh, it's it's important to think at the introgression at some genes to favor also in some cases adaptation in these kind of times where you have a much stronger selection pressures, but also not always suggesting rescue because you are losing a lot of divergence in that case. I completely agree, and and I think that that was a point that was made by Christian as well, and I, I totally agree. I just, I just um, you know, and, and a, a good example of that is the, the endothelin um, polymorphism that has been clearly non-adaptively introgressed between uh, alpaca and yama in, 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 you would never choose to introgress that, that gene because clearly it's linked to other genes which are very, very deleterious. And, and it's not something that we would um, advocate at all. I just think that um, it, it is clearly something that is going on, that, that the new genomic data is highlighting that perhaps we didn't previously um, take enough account of and but i agree that the message to the the um to the to the policymakers is not that this is a good excuse for genetic rescue willy-nilly but th that it is that it and and that that we oftentimes we're not going to be able to understand how it happened anyway so i think we have to be very careful about it but i i do think that introgression generally um is something that that is perhaps one of the most interesting observations of the post-genomic era that 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 you know maybe 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 um maybe it's changing the way that we think a little bit um mm. but I, i'm not i'm not arguing that we dissolve species or anything mm. of that nature i'm just saying that um that that people need to be a bit more careful about interpreting and being so typological perhaps yeah yeah i agree in some way it might be also a, a good process for rapid evolution in, in a few generations. Yeah, absolutely. In changing environments. Yeah, and that's, that seems to be what we're seeing in some instances with, with the, some of these examples. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Good point, Giorgio. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'll give one final chance then uh, if anybody has anything else they would like to raise. If not, um, I can't see any further hands. If, you, if, you, if you're having trouble raising your hand, do feel free just to open the mic and ask. Otherwise, I think it just falls to me to say thank you once again, Mike. That was an excellent opening seminar for the series and it was great to have you along and there was a lot there for all of us, I think. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Yes, thanks to all of you in the audience. And I'm just gonna hand back to Christian uh, for a final word before we close. Thank you, Stephen. I have only one thing to announce today. I just wanted to make uh, a bit of advertisement for the next seminar we have next Wednesday from Rebecca Jordan. She will take about more uh, plant restoration using genomics and also trees in Australia. She is from Australia, she's working in Australia. That's why the seminar will be at nine o'clock in the morning. We can't do it in the afternoon. So you can still register for that seminar. You will get the Zoom link again about 24 hours before and you can join us. Thank you very much.